All right. Well, good afternoon. Um, my name is Sean Darrington, uh, Senior Director of Product Management here at Exablox. Um, what I want to do is uh, now transition to showing you our cloud-based management service, uh, One System. Uh, one System is, is what we've actually begun from uh, when we first started developing OneBlox, how are we going to manage it? This has been the one way. Um, this actually is our own, um, another instance of One System, not production instance, as you would imagine. But everybody, man, all of our customers manage their storage via onesystem.exablox.com. Uh, there is an alternative to do a private one system deployment um, as a VM via, deployed via a Docker container, but I'm going to show you the web-based uh, version here. Right? Uh, so if you don't do it via Docker container, um, you, can, you have all the same features and functions. Um, there's a little bit of differences between two-factor authentication for security in terms of uh, using Google Authenticator, but you, for the most part, it's functionally the same. So I want to show a couple things. Um, so to, you, yeah, Enrico? Did you do that for, uh, for uh, this big customer that you mentioned at the beginning or because uh... yeah uh, we, we went we d went the private one system route largely for larger larger, larger customers like financial organizations they don't want anything going out uh, we, there's no data stored in one system uh, everything is stored locally even if they are using it for file serving and uh, we're authenticated with AD as part of their domain uh, there's nothing stored in the cloud that's proprietary some companies are even overly conscious <laughs> about uh, server names or any, uh, any information about the company itself, even if it's not the data, the alarms and alerts and notifications are all cloud-based, right? So we get the same alert that they do, right? So people wanted to have that option for private <coughs> one system. So the, the subscription service is exactly the same. Uh, they can just choose one deployment or the other. But uh, then uh, how do you manage the support? Because if I remember well, the one system yep. manages the support for you. So the the, yeah. the notification of a, of a problem. So we have, um, so in, even in private one system, well here, let me show you. So I'm gonna drill down. So this is actually, um, I have three different companies set up and if you're an MSP, we have people doing this like for backup services, et cetera. So they're managing their 10, 20 customers out of New York. They can do this even though they're completely different entities. But when you drill into this, now you have your different clusters, okay? Um, and I'm gonna answer your question, Enrico, about uh, drilling into New York here. When you get into each individual one blocks, you have the ability to support the turning on or off remote access. So even in private one system, they can enable us to securely <laughs> come in via a reverse it. tunnel to manage their storage. Um, some people, like we have to do web access because <laughs> they don't allow anything to go out and we work with those customers too. But this is how even somebody that's on one system or private one system can enable or disable support access. They don't maintain any um, service information outside of the one box itself, I mean. Oh, we do. So if they're using one system, uh, we capture all of that. I mean, we, okay. know, we know the history, we know how much storage they have, what the disk Warm drives are, and all the alerts stuff. and notifications um, uh, going on there. Uh, and, and we even, so this is actually one of the things that is beneficial a lot of times. Um, one of the customers, it was a museum down in uh, the San Diego area. Every night we would see the one blocks lose communication. And we would get a thing saying, hey, one blocks can't communicate with one system. And it would last for about 15 minutes. And it was every night at 10 p.m. And we you know, called the customers like, what's going on? And they're like, we come in the morning and it's back up and running. We're looking at the logs, nothing. Turns out the cleaning lady was using the same outlet to <laughs> vacuum uh, that the one box was using. So she'd unplug it and plug it back in. So yeah, so we see all that. And you do support two-factor authentication, you said? We do. Uh, you can, uh, through Google Authenticator, uh, or you can do it via text messaging as well, SMS, international as well. I started to go in, but I'm not going to go through that workflow. But it's, uh, yeah, either one of those will work. And then login, are you doing any single sign-on type capabilities with uh, like corporate credentials or something like that? So not corporate credentials, because that would um, we haven't done that. You have single sign-on between one system and like our support. Uh, so uh, what you use to like submit tickets and everything, so that's a single sign-on. But we don't offer single sign-on for companies to integrate that. Because uh, typically the storage admins for one system are uh, you know, a handful of people, not all the users, like their Active Directory users. Because if they're using us for file serving and primary data, they're going to go to the AD for authentication to access permissions to those files or folders that they would control anyway outside. So most of our, one, most of our companies, even the bigger ones, they have less than five to seven admins. So you see a lot of use for Exablox as primary storage? Yeah, we've got about half of our customers using us for primary. Um, and there's a lot of people, 
uh, dumping log files, uh, archiving. Um, we've got a lot of uh, traction with uh, healthcare organizations right now uh, because of the ransomware threat. Um, they're uh, one of the hospitals in Washington State we were working with. Um, they actually, um, the assessment among the healthcare community is that the risk exposure for them is $350 per medical record if they're infected with ransomware. And so even the small, it's about 80 bed hospital, their risk exposure is about $20 million. Their insurance policy is $2 million. So they've got a way, they have to figure out a way to manage that risk. Uh, and one of the ways is by using us to have all the file serving storage because if anything happens, if they're infected, they can go back to snapshots and recover this. Uh, Christopher Rural Health um, um, spoke with Fortune about this. Uh, he was infected and they got their, their users' information back uh, within a day in terms of identifying it, doing it, all the normal security, um, you know, wipe the hard drive, reinstall, copy the files back, and that was all in less than a day. Um, so that's a lot, a lot of things. And so that type of primary search, we're not, even though we are now VMware ready certified, we've got a number of customers doing VMware, tier two, cloning VMs, you know, dumping um, uh, uh, either you know, snapshots to us um, via the, the VMware, but we're not being you know, tier one VMs. We're not delivering 10,000 IOPS with a hard drive, one box cluster, right? When you do the private one system deployment, that can be Active Directory authenticated for management? Everything can be okay. uh, in, both, in both scenarios. So the, um, you actually just, so the short answer is yes. So we just look like another computer name. And so this name here, uh, London, mm -hmm. um, the, which, which is the cluster name, that's what shows up when you browse to that on the network. And so customers can do access-based enumeration, they can hide snapshot directories, they control file folder or share level access uh, just through their AD permissions. So I mean like through this interface specifically, so like when I, what, if I were to deploy one system locally in my data center just to manage my own... This uh, is exactly what you would see except okay. for one system being, except for the URL being one system dash QA dot it mm -hmm. would be uh, one system dot my company dot com. Right, okay. And then and that, but that can still be accurate, Active Directory authenticated. I can do group membership for that if you yep. can log in. Okay. The only thing you need username, password, domain controller, and then Windows right mouse permissions. Okay, perfect. Yep. So um, I wanted to just show a couple things within, within one system. One of the things that a lot of times um, is difficult is keeping up to date on software. Uh, so I mentioned with one system, we actually deploy and manage one system. So when we're ready to roll out the multi-site remote replication, we do that in the background. All the customers have uh, the ability now to take advantage of that um, via this new interface. And anybody, all of our existing Exoblox customers, this is what it's gonna look like um, in a few days. Uh, so now you can just choose which share you would like to replicate. Right? So it's very easy to do this, but also at the same time, I'm gonna come up a level and show you, in order for, we rev one system and one block software about every four to six weeks, rolling out new features, fixing things, et cetera. But the only thing an organization has to do if they're gonna update their one blocks is to hit that teal button. And in about 10 minutes, it downloads the software, applies it, restarts the file system, and they are now on the new version. That's about, it. You know, so your current field base, how much is on a current release versus previous releases? So, um, 2.12 is a current release, um, and I would say 85 to 90 percent are within N minus two. And how old is 2.12? How old? Um, last week. I'm sorry, you said 85 to 95 percent of your install base is on 2.12? No, no, no. 2.12 was released last week, yeah. And then N minus two. So there's two versions before that, N which is within two. I would say two to three months. So, and all of our, yeah, that's the short answer. So what if I'm not on the internet? Can I update now with USB or whatever? Not with, not with a USB. If you're like a private one system, you don't have external access, um, you, there's a, you go to download.exablocks.com and you can download that OVA okay. externally on the public internet, from your laptop or whatever, and then move that into the private network. And then you would you just do a one system update or upgrade is the command and then you have that software to uh, okay. do that. So that solves the dark one blocks upgrade problem. No. Okay. Um, so, I, uh, yeah. You said you did a release every six weeks, is that what, something like that? So yeah. N minus 12, my N minus two would be 12 weeks ago, roughly a quarter ago. 
85 95% of your install base is at that release level? Yeah. We have a, so yes, they keep current. Um, it's very unusual. Yeah, it is. And, and it's kind of on that cadence. So, for example, because we roll out not only just uh, <coughs> normal fixes and things that we find, but also we're rolling out new features very, very quickly. Um, so, for example, um, this view here, when, uh, when we rolled out uh, access based enumeration, so I'm not, enable, I'm not authenticated with Active Directory, otherwise this would change and you would see access-based enumeration as an option. People want to hide snapshot directories all together in some cases. Sometimes they just want to hide the share name. Those types of things we just roll out and, and you can do that very, very easily. And with a push button upgrade, it's very easy, even for people who are using it for primary storage, to carve out a 10 minute window uh, of interruption. Who's set up uh, remote replication on uh, RAID-based systems before? Any, right, better question, who is not, right? <laughs> um, so it's never a fun task to do. Um, we've really tried to take a different approach uh, and make it, make it straightforward and easy. So this is, uh, I'm gonna come up uh, one level here to the overview page where you can see all the different clusters. And I named the clusters, you can see there's not data on here, this is just the test lab in the back, but I put different city names just based upon where those clusters could be, even though they're all in the back room there. So if I'm gonna do replication, now I can begin to decide on a per share basis how I wanna replicate this. Um, Ray, you were asking between what the recovery point is. So here's the RPO that's identified for each share. It'll tell you exactly what it is. And it's not gonna be the same across all shares across all clusters, particularly in a multi-ring or multi-cluster environment. But let's say that I wanna replicate my, my Veeam uh, share on London over to uh, a different one. So I now literally just click replicate and then from here, I see the available one blocks rings. Uh, and if there are five, there are five. If there's two like this one, because one, London is one of the primaries, I can choose that. Um, now, if I'm going over my firewall, I just put in the external IP address of my network, the firewall port. Um, in this case, I don't have any of that. It's actually on the same network, so I just leave it blank. Um, and now you're done. So anything I write into Veeam is just gonna be continuously replicated uh, to the Veeam replica, the read-only version on San Francisco. And if I want to stop the replication at a point in time, if I wanna pause it for whatever reason, I'm, I'm doing a seeding of my replication in the same data center, I'm gonna stop the replication, I'm gonna ship it to my remote one, I'm gonna resume it there. Uh, you can do that very easily. Uh, the promote is where you promote a read-only share to read-write. And I mentioned earlier, it takes about a minute for that file system to become read-write. And again, this is all because it's a content addressable object store. We can flip the switch and flip the personality on objects very easily because it's immutable. So the, um, the last thing, I'm just watching the time here as well. Uh, I'm gonna log into a, a different um, instance of one system. And this is another, talking about the features that we're rolling out. So this is gonna be rolled out in the next month or so as well. Uh, this is actually more the performance reporting that we're doing. So we see a lot, um, and customers that have, you know, if they're saying, hey, my backups aren't going as quickly as I thought they would, or something's changed from day one to, thanks. <coughs> so uh, Cisco's helping me out here with a big delay between, <coughs> between this. So uh, I'm seeing my ring, my cluster here. Um, <coughs> This happened last time when I added storage to a one blocks when we were timing it. It took like that, but Cisco ruined the. I think you remember that. Yeah, I remember yeah. that. Yeah. Um, so this is a, this is another instance. So we see a lot of things in the background because we have support access. We can tell customers what the disk I/O is, what the network is looking like, how many drop packets, etc. So now we're taking the first step to providing this type of reporting for customers. And so now, when the next maintenance we do on one system, when we upgrade, upgrade that they're gonna be able to see not only all their use capacity and data reduction, so I'm actually just running like an FIO to this box. It's just been writing for the, for the last few hours here. Um, you can see, you know, it's received 1.7 terabytes, a little bit of compression. We, did, we do no dedupe runs too, to just stress the system in addition to dedupe runs. Uh, so that's why you're not seeing much of the data reduction there. But I'm gonna come back up here and show you the reporting. So capacity reporting um, is, this started off right from the beginning. Um, you can see over time, this is how customers can begin to see over the month or a year or three months, depending on how long they've had their one blocks, what that utilization is looking like. And it tells them 
and you can zoom in at any point in time to get a more fine-grained view of how that capacity is trending in terms of consuming that storage. Um, so not only do we do capacity reporting, uh, we also look at deduplication. So this is where you're going to see not very much deduplication, and this is updated frequently. Um, so that's why this just started. But you'll see a trending line depending upon how many backups and what that data reduction is um, on a daily basis. And then lastly, for recovery point. Um, now in this case, this is I don't have any mesh set up, so you're not seeing the recovery point. But Ray, your point about where those times are. If I was to go back to the one system QA instance, for each share that I would see a different recovery point over time. So I can see how far behind I am. So if I need to make network adjustments, if I need to make storage consumption adjustments, whatever reason, I can begin to make different informed <coughs> decisions. And this is the new feature that, by the way, that's all available now. All of our one system as well, uh, customers can see that. But now uh, we're giving them the ability to see the performance reports like this. So I have a single 10 gig connection to this one blocks, uh, and you can see the different performance. And I'm not stressing this box, uh, but you can see that you know, it's just continually writing out, and we've got it fluctuating and so forth. But not only the, the network performance in terms of megabytes per second, but also you can see different um, disk I.O. So for all the disk in the system, you can start to take a look at that. And then also network. I meant to show the, uh, the, the drop packets here. If you're really worried about um, what you're looking at, you can see if you have any re drop packets or send errors, that's all down here at the bottom. There's basically zero on our network. Uh, but we do have people, for example, if they don't configure uh, balance ALB correctly on their network, or if the switch doesn't support that, it'll drop a lot of packets. If they've got jumbo frames somewhere in the network, you'll see a ton of drop packets, right? This is where they can start to see that on a per port basis. Um, and so this is the first step that people are going to be able to take advantage of in the next month or so. At the same time, we're moving to, and we'll talk about this a little bit later, application level view, right? Because we're separating that logical file system view from everything underneath the covers, we're going to be able to provide customers what the average latency is, response time, capacity utilization. A lot of the things that you'd expect from a traditional RAID-based system, we're going to be presenting that also through one system uh, in the performance reporting. A lot of customers who are managed service providers who are doing multi-tenancy like backups to a single exa block at their site? We do. Uh, not a lot. I would say a, a handful. Um, the difference is, and it's going to be more of the backup use case than primary file serving, because each one block's cluster can be authenticated with a single domain. And we support trusted domains and child and so forth, but you can't have organization A domain and organization B domain in the same cluster, right? Because we look like the computer name can't be shared. So for the backup use case, we do. Um, out of New York um, and Washington, um, San Diego, uh, they've got that. And because it's just a pool of storage, they can have, you know, you drop a single one blocks in, right. in a customer and you've got 100 terabytes raw, right? Um, and then that can come back to a five node ring in their data center, in their colo. Uh, right. So yeah, we do. And then they have the management of everything centrally, uh, regardless of how many customers or where they're physically located. Um, as long as they can communicate externally to one system, you're good. Um, but even the larger customers, like we're doing a deployment for a larger enterprise customer, it's going to be their own network, but they're looking at five different locations in five countries. Um, and they're going to do a private one system deployment in Spain, but they're going to have Toronto and Tokyo and London. And that network can all get back to private one system. They're going to manage everything out of Spain. Hmm. Right. Any other uh, questions on kind of overview a little bit about one system? I know I didn't spend a lot of time going into a lot of details on it, but I want to give you guys a sense of kind of what our customers are doing because you know, with the cloud first initiative, we're not retrofitting anything. This is what we've designed from the beginning uh, to really scale uh, not only if you're an organization managing multiple clusters and locations, but also as our number of customers scale. You know, this is something we just literally turn the knob on how many resources we give to one system. Okay. So you, you said the largest customers has seven nodes. No, uh, more than that, but I mean, the largest cluster is seven. Yeah, the, the large cluster is seven nodes. Yeah. Uh, the, um, the average cluster that you sell no, for in the, uh, your customers, so it's one node, two nodes, three nodes. Um, more in the, I would say the three node. We've got a lot of single node deployments, in you know, in the, in a also single node multiple location, and we've got a good percentage of five and seven node. So it averages out to I would say three to three, maybe five, because you scale in odd numbers. Um, for the consensus algorithm we use for membership, we work in odd numbers. So you yeah, go one, three, five, one, seven, five, seven. Yeah. So three, five is. Uh, and yeah. most common installation. Yeah. 
And the data protection within uh, within one block is uh, is RAID or? Uh... So we don't do any RAID. Uh, we actually uh, replicate the data. So we replicate every object um, three times. Three times. Um, and then we put that on different disk drives in a one block. And so if you're in a w single one block, we'll put that on three different drives. If you're multi multiple one blocks, if you go to three one blocks, we'll put one on each of the disk drives. Uh, and this is one of the things that, um, that we're going to take a deep dive in that Charles is going to do for what we call placement groups. Uh, and this is the next evolution about our ability to intelligently place objects on different fault domains. Minimum drive number is? Three. And minimum drive capacity is one terabyte. Um, believe it or not, we do have people that start with a terabyte. Like they have just drives laying around, they start with a terabyte and then they add $79, I think $79 or so today for a one terabyte drive. It's pretty inexpensive. But you're not going to spend $12,000 and then put one terabyte drives in it. Most people don't. <laughs>